Okay, so this first one, home sales. Oh, this is an interesting one. Looking at overall home sales, looking at, you know, 1989. Jim, when did you start in this business? <laughs> you really want to know? I really want to know. 75. Holy mackerel. <laughs> yeah, which puts you at about 75 years old. So, all right, so Jim, um, so Jim got in here, 75, I got in 98. So just for perspective, as we're looking at this, you know, obviously Jim has seen this entire thing. Um, and I've seen the vast majority of it. So uh, what in looking at this graph, Jim, do you think is most important? Number one, that it's cyclical, you know, that okay. you're always gonna have highs and lows, but in the last uh, 20 years, uh, this right here was an anomaly. Okay. Uh, this, this bubble, uh, was just not normal. Uh, there were a lot of abuses with appraisals, uh, with the, the lack of uh, checks and balances in the financial institution. The market just went absolutely bonkers. And it just could not sustain itself. And it collapsed. And it collapsed big time. And it took several years before it could uh, finally recover. So, Do you see my arrow on there too? Is my arrow, my white arrow on there? No, this is my arrow moving. This is this is mine. Oh, you stop moving, Jim. Stop. No, I'm moving. Stop moving. <laughs> okay, can you guys see this arrow? The one that's moving? Anyone? No. You guys are all on mute. Jim, can you see my white arrow? No. no <laughs> so let's talk care. about it then. Okay. Yeah, so I, I agree. I mean, it's very important to identify the difference between this two, 2002 to 2007 bubble, right? It went up and down, a bubble goes up and down in what we're experiencing right now, because the vast majority of people that are looking at the market right now are thinking that it's similar to what it was back in 2006, and it's not. It's not because we didn't have this massive increase. You can see, if you look at 2016, you're at 5.5 and then 5.5, 5.3 and then 5.6. This is a just a, a relatively balanced and nice gentle uptick, similar to what you're seeing since like 2012 when we came out of the you know essentially came out of the the recession. Um, and so that bubble is not what we're experiencing right now, and that's really important because we don't want to act the same. Yeah, and so if people start to talk about the bubble, there is no bubble. This is a bubble. This resulted in foreclosures up the yin yang. I mean, it was just, it was very depressing. Uh, and you, you could see how it just dropped and it took years to finally recover. And that's gonna be important. I'm gonna to jump to this slide right now because I wanna prove a point. You see this yellow line? This is a 30 year average. So when you are talking to clients, uh, this 30 year average is long term and it's about a 4% per annum growth in prices. Mm -hmm. Look what happened after the bubble. This went above. It was crazy town. Uh, everything was just literally out of control and then it came crashing down. So, where are we today? 297. Had we stayed on the 4% per annum growth curve, where should it have been? 317. So what this says is we are still far below what we normally would have had price-wise. And if people are saying, well, prices are just out of control right now. No, they were undervalued all of these years. And right now the market is trying to catch up. Does that make sense? I agree. And I think if you look from 2013 to 2018, that slope is, is like a year over year, almost identical growth pattern to what we saw from 1989 all the way up until like 2001. You yeah. know, so that, that's, that's the type of growth that we're naturally going to see. Yeah. If, if you were to connect these graphs, it would literally run parallel to this one. Yeah. So it's it's basically a new 4% per annum growth rate, you know, but it's just a little bit lower. But so we are 
cry, trying to catch up to prices that were undervalued. So when somebody says, oh my gosh, I want $20,000 over asking price, it's because it was undervalued to begin with and we're now trying to get caught up. If so I have a question for our guests with relation to that, okay? So we've got Maureen, Caitlin, Alex, and owner. Who's owner? Change your name. Who is the owner? Oh, Caitlin's on here too, okay. There's an owner. It's Terry Friedline, I'm just wanting power. No, you are right. <laughs> ah, Terry. Maybe you can click on that and change your name to Ding Dong or something. There you go. <laughs> um, so <laughs> that's it. I want to ask a question. I think this is an important <laughs> question because this is one of the things that's going to come up when you're talking with clients. I'm going to um, specifically ask this so that I can get you guys to, you know, to think a little bit further about what's happening in the market right now. Why do we anticipate that we will not be seeing the quantity of foreclosures and the, you know, the, the, the high risk with foreclosures that we saw back in 2007 and eight? Um, well, I'm not necessarily versed on this topic, but uh, it seems like the lending practices are better and the mortgage rates are lower or the interest rates are lower. Okay, so I just heard you say that the lending practices are a little bit safer, they're better, you know, and, and they're, they're more regulated for sure um, and a little bit safer, right? And what does that do in relation to foreclosure? Like why, when, when rent, when lend, lending, when there's no regulations on lending institutions and they can do an option arm loan or no interest loan or a loan with no income verification whatsoever, does that not make it a lot more risky for those loans to, you know, for people to be able to continue to pay because the, the standard in which they were approved was so incredibly low? I mean, right? I think it is that, uh, I mean, people aren't able to get a loan for something they won't be able to afford. Well, Got it. And here was one other thing that was happening, guys. Um, right now, if, if, you, if your buyer is a little cash short, um, short of uh, being a veteran, and, and that's what, zero down, what's the next percentage of loan to value? FHA is what? 3.5, 3 right? Yeah, three and a half, yeah. Okay. So you can also get a 3% conventional. Now, anything less than a 20% down, what does the buyer have to pay? MIP, mortgage insurance premium. Uh, it's, it's an insurance policy. Why? Because it's a riskier loan. Here's what was happening back in these days during the bubble and the unregulation. It was like the Wild West. They would take an 80% LTV and then take out a second on top of that so that you didn't have mortgage insurance premiums. Well, not only that, but the second mortgage was 20%. So you do an 80% first mortgage and a 20% second mortgage. So you had 100% of your property mortgaged. Now, what happens when, when the property value goes down? Then you are 100% mortgaged. So if you have $200,000 house and you take 200,000 in mortgage on that house and the value drops to 190, now you're upside down. That prompts foreclosure. There's another major reason, apart from the lending institutions uh, being more regulated and being more conservative with who they're borrowing to, there's another major component, is that when prices of homes went down, realtors couldn't sell them because there was nobody to buy them because people couldn't afford houses. Do we have that problem today? A little bit. No. Because every, don't we, I mean, there's to way, somebody, way, too, don't we? there's way too many buyers to buy houses right now. Do we know that for a fact? Yes, we do. There's way more buyers than there are houses. So, what's the probability of a house not selling? It's very low. Low the probability of a house not selling for what somebody owes on it. It's even lower because mm. the graph that that um, Jim showed the in, initial one. When you're looking at that rate rise in values, you know, you're looking at people, anyone who's selling right now probably bought their house in 2012, 2013, and they may, maybe they've got to sell now. Well, if they bought it and they bought it at 10% down or 20% down, they already had equity in their house and it's gone up 4% per year. So the probability of us not being able to sell a house and it actually being under what's owed on a house is almost none. 
It's almost nothing. So the possibility of having foreclosures, in my opinion, is it's, it's there's there really shouldn't be any. So, wow, there will be there will be when you look at this chart. But you have to look at it by the different industry sector. Which one was the most affected? Leisure and hospitality. Now, what kinds of uh, employees are typically in this industry? The restaurant? Not, yeah, you got restaurant, you, you've got uh, people that are you know, being paid by the hour, uh, minimum wage or thereabouts. Uh, now, they're high unemployment because of the COVID. And you know, this, this grouping in the leisure and hospitality uh, is, is not real, real strong as opposed to financial services and activities and professionals. Look at the difference in earnings and look at the grouping of individuals who uh, have been impacted by unemployment. Now, let me ask you guys this question. That goes in, that goes in with what you were just saying, Rick. Yeah, and so let me, it prompts this following question for you guys then. Um, Maureen has her hand up, right? I think she does. Yes, I do. I can wait though till you're on that topic. Go no, ahead. go ahead. And, well, could, can you answer? Do you want to answer? I didn't see that, but do you want to answer that previous question? Which previous? I was, I had my hand raised to ask a question. <laughs> so, oh, well, ask the question. We're ready. Okay, so what I was wondering is because inventory is so low and houses are selling for well beyond sometimes even their appraisal value, what happens when a home right now sells for just a ridiculous amount of money um, and, and it's still under contract and you know, down the road, aren't they gonna be upside down if that the home value goes way down? It depends. Part of what we talked about is, well, first of all, the home value would have to go way down. Mm -hmm. And you can see that right now we're looking at probably a minimum of a 4% increase or appreciation per year, because that's what we were looking at, right? Okay. There's that graph again. Thank you, Jim. Um, and the second thing is anybody who's paying, this is very important. Anybody who's paying uh, an exorbitant amount of money over mm -hmm. is be highly qualified. They are the cream of the crop. There's a survival of the fittest. There are third category of buyers, the best buyers in the business right now. Those people have got solid jobs, which means that they're probably not putting 5% down because when you've got 10 offers on a property and you're looking at 10 different buyers, you're picking the best buyer. That best buyer is not gonna be a three and a half percent FHA buyer, right? It's gonna be 10, 20% down you know, buyer. And look at what Jim's showing now is in coming from an industry in which they're making lots of money. So again, it, it limits the probability that we're going to have issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they're, they're putting a little bit more money down than years ago when they were getting in with zero down. Absolutely. There's, they, they still at closing have built equity. And then another yeah. question that I have for you guys is, and also just another point on that is keep in mind, they're not paying these premium prices for crappy houses. They're paying premium prices for houses that are, you know, either serving the post pandemic needs. So it's acreage, it's properties a little bit further out, it's properties with pools, properties on lakes um, or properties in very, very good locations, which are obviously more uh, a safer real estate bet than a, a property that's in, a, you know, an, a not a great neighborhood in not great condition. Right, so there's some protection there as well. But with relation to this, this is really uh, something that I talk to every single seller about when we're going into our listing appointments. This is a graph that Jim has up right now. I want you guys to tell me when you're looking at this graph and you're looking at uh, the scale there, who are, what are the industries in which our buyers are coming from that are buying houses? I just lost the graph. I did yeah, so too. did I. Jimmy, is Jim still? I think, he, I think Jim's off the call right now. Okay, so basically that graph, you guys, you know, you've got service with a high, un, a high unemployment rate and a low amount of income being generated by the industry. And then you go to the opposite end of the scale and you have finance as the highest amount of money being earned in 
earned income and the lowest amount of unemployment. So when you look at that graph, it's interesting as you go through those eight different industries, it goes from service down here all the way up, 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 up. Sales are in the middle, so we're in the middle somewhere, right? And it goes all the way up to finance. Who are our buyers right now? I'm not sure if this is a trick question, but I'm thinking it's the finance people who are making lots of money and going, well, I don't know. I don't know. They, def they definitely are. Uh, Kaylin, uh, how do I say that? Azurea? 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 Marine, Marine, that's easy. Alex, what do you think? Which industries are the ones? In the middle of the road ones. Okay. The top 50%. Almost a deal. If you, if you were to look at that graph again, and we were to look at those, it's people have to earn enough money, uh, you know, and, and, and also have, a, you know, a decent unemployment rate uh, in order to afford a house, right? Not everybody can afford houses right now, right? So let's just say you've got, I'll make it simple. You've got eight industries. You've got starting at the bottom, going to the top, starting with uh, service, going all the way up to, to finance. Um, and of those eight industries, from the middle up, the, the top, uh, you know, uh, four or five income producing industries, those are the ones that are making enough money to buy houses. Were they affected in the pandemic? Absolutely not. The, the critical thing to understand is that the 50% the, the of these industries were not affected in any way. Actually, they boomed. You know, the top 25% of the income generating industries boomed in the pandemic. So the luxury buyers and buyers above 600,000, there's way more of them. Um, Jim, Jim's back and he'll grab that other graph. There's yeah, sorry about that. Today. My, my whole Wi-Fi just dropped. Yeah. Oh. Welcome back, buddy. Thank you. Okay. Where do you want me to and go? The income separation one, the industry one. All right. Hang on. So, so Rick, yeah. um, there you go. this is, this is such a good class for me because these honestly, each, every time we do the, the, um, market center meetings and everything there's something in me that when these come up i go because eh, i just go i don't know what i do with these so this is super helpful for me okay. but when you're going and you're talking to your clients what does this do for them what is what is this telling them okay that's yeah. a good question so this is exactly what i say okay um i'm trying to think jordan and i we were at what was the listening appointment we're at? Green, uh, not Granger, but uh, the other one here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, one of the things that does is people first are looking for why is the market doing what it's doing? You know, what's happening right now, you know, and, and, and what's going to happen with the market? Well, it's important for people to understand that how the pandemic has affected our sales right now. And this is a very, very clear and precise explanation as to how the pandemic has affected our real estate sales. Because one of the things that there's animosity about is why are houses selling so fast? Why are realtors making so much money? Why are sellers making money when we're coming out of a pandemic in which half of the half of the country lost miserably, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, can you? You just text her and stuff and see if we can get that from Melinda. Sorry, we got us people doing a final walkthrough right now in a house. So let, I'll, I'll tell you right now, um, Terry, I want you to yeah. look at the graph and we're just going to focus on the bright green. This is the weekly earnings, okay? So this is what people okay. are. We'll take a quick peek at the orange at the same time, but looking at the right leisure and hospitality, and then you go retail, it's going up. Education and health services is going up. Transportation is going up more. Manufacturing, construction, even more. Wholesale trade, more professional business, that's us. That's us. And then finance, that's our lenders, right? And anybody who's doing, you know, who's an investment banker. So now you're talking to your seller and you're saying, this is what happened in the, in the pandemic. The reason why houses are selling like crazy is because first of all, look at how well from, from you know, transportation and warehousing up to finance activities, look at how well that 50% of the economy did last year. People need to know that. People need to know that 50% of the economy did exceptionally well. That's why there's a greater separation of wealth in our country today than we've ever seen because of what happened last year. 
So right now, these lower industries, unfortunately, people were hit badly, and it was it was difficult. In our business, they're not buyers of houses; those are renters, generally speaking. Okay. Which one? The yeah. transportation, warehousing, education, retail trade, and leisure. Gotcha. Sorry, just not didn't making you. enough okay. money to qualify for a house over two hundred thousand. Right? Generally right. speaking. We're generalizing so that we understand this perspective that the, 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 the pandemic put us in a situation where not only did all the buyers who were there before still exist, but they did exceptionally well in their industries last year. They can afford to buy houses. Mm -hmm. People are going crazy. That's why there's not as many. So what do we have for housing availability? We need to shift into that. Well, this is uh, unemployment and housing by age. <clears throat> this might also help answer Terry's question. You know, these are trade up buyers. These are trade up buyers. Uh, the millennials are usually the first time home buyers. These guys are typically going to be renting. So it goes hand in hand with what Rick was just talking about. Uh, these are the trade up buyers. And they're the ones who have the good jobs. They're the ones who have the money. They're putting you know, lots of bucks down. So they've already built up equity and they're willing to pay top dollar. So let's see what else we got here. We got uh, yeah. historical perspective. No, unemployment, mm, no. Affordability. Uh, this is also factoring in, housing is very affordable right now. When you have interest rates are down around 3%, yeah, they're, they're climbing up a little bit, but still historically low. Back in 1980, in this time frame, interest rates were anywhere from 18 to 20% and houses were still selling. Excuse me, can I just ask you with these, um, and this could be a silly question, just saying, um, if you're saying the 18 percent what what are those numbers those aren't percents right 17 17 no. 16 this what is, are those this is an affordability index and i that few went there yeah fewer people because housing was taking up a larger percentage of their monthly payment the mortgage ah. interest rate was 18 and 20 percent that's a huge piece of the uh, monthly payment. So fewer people could afford to buy houses at those higher interest rates, but they were still selling. Look at this now, it's half. You know, you're 3%. It's, it's almost, they're giving money away. So it's a whole lot more affordable, which also then pokes hole, holes in the theory of, oh, we got another bubble coming up. No, we don't. No, we don't. It's an entirely different uh, set of circumstances. See, that's the thing, the wording that I'm getting a lot. Well, you know what? It's got to come down. So I'm just going to wait and, you know, see what happens. How do you Let's answer that? Is it okay if we shift gears and talk a little bit then about, I know this has all been about, you know, affordability and home prices increasing and stuff. Um, I was hoping that we had a graph that showed the availability of homes. Um, and I don't think that we do. We've got quantity home sales and stuff, but um, availability of homes is going to be uh, something else going through all of them. No. Employment annually. But no, we don't have those. Sorry. And yeah, I'd like to shift to that for just a minute, Terry, because this is a conversation that each one of you guys should be having with um, your buyers and sellers right now. So this is a conversation that I've had with um, every single one of my sellers is they're deciding whether they should sell now, take advantage of the market and then do an interim living until they find a place. So like, why are there no homes on the market? And I'll, I'll give you this example. Terry, where do you live? Give me a community. Where do you live? Um, Forest Lake. Okay. She lives in Forest Lake. Okay. So if she said Edina, I'd say there'd be 500 homes a year that need to sell in Edina. She said Forest Lake. So there's like four. Um, I'm just kidding. So let's use, let's keep it simple. We're going to use 100 homes. Okay. There's 100 homes in Forest Lake. This is all hypothetical. It's 100 homes that need to be sold every year in Forest Lake. Okay. As a result of the pandemic, 50 of those homes, 50 of those home sellers decided not to sell because they were afraid that somebody would come into their home with a disease that could kill them. So we took 50% of our potential listings and they were gone. 
because of the risk of the pandemic. That's the first variable. Now, now we take the out of those 50 people that are left that could potentially sell in Forest Lake, now we take 25 of them. 25 of those people's kids came back from high school or came back from college and are living in their house trying to study and make ends meet from an education standpoint. Super complicated, super difficult. Who would wanna sell their house with their children there trying to do school? Now we have 25 homes left. Of those 25 homes left, one of them's Terry. And of those 25, 12 of them said, you know what, I'm not gonna sell right now because there's nothing out there. And there's never gonna be anything out there because the market is so crazy right now. Therein lies the reason we have no houses on the market. That's why we have such a low supply. That begs the question, is it going to change? Yes, right now we have a 40% discrepancy between the quantity of buyers and the houses available, okay? Buyers can change when interest rates go up. Are interest rates gonna go up? Somebody answer that question, okay? Yeah. We already are. Yes. yes, they are. There's $2 trillion that was already put into our economy. It didn't come from nowhere. It didn't, it just all of a sudden didn't just show up and we got $2 trillion. And there's another $2 trillion that was a pro proposed yesterday for infrastructure. That's $4 trillion being put into our economy. It needs to get paid back. It'll get paid back in corporate taxes. It'll get paid back in wealth taxes. It'll get paid back in increase in the uh, cost of all of our energies. Gas is gonna go up, electricity will go up, natural gas will go up. However, it absolutely must also solicit the increase of, of interest rates. That's a big way to pay back some of this debt that the country is now putting into, you know, into the economy, okay? Go ahead, Terry. No, I, no, I was just getting irritated. So go ahead. I'm, I'm yeah. almost done, I'm almost done, so. No, no, it's so, good. So, so interest rates will go up. So if we have a 40% discrepancy, interest rates go up that we may lose 10% of buyers. Let's just say we lose 10%. We still have a 30% discrepancy. So we need the supply to come up. How is the supply gonna come up? Well, first of all, is supply going up? Is it going to? Nod your head. Is supply gonna go up? Yes or no? Yeah, is it? Is it gonna go up? Okay, this is why supply is going to go up and uh, without question. Okay, supply is gonna go up because are we getting out of the pandemic a little bit? Is there a little bit of pandemic relief? That was 50% houses, right? Yes, there is. Are children going back to school? Uh, yes, they are. Are kids going back to college? Yes, they are, right? Is school almost over? Yes, it is. Do sellers, are sellers now aware that they can sell their house at a much higher price than they could have last year? Yes, they are. It's our responsibility. What's the possibility that the that supply will not go up? It's almost none. There's too many variables there that we're taking off the table that was limiting our supply that then now the supply is gonna come back. So I consider that a softening of the market. It's super aggressive right now. It's, a, it's, it's kind of a little bit like Jim was saying about a little bit of wild, wild west when it comes to this, there's too much separation between supply and demand. So we may get an increase of supply about 10%. That's still going to put us at a discrepancy. We're going to have 20% of a discrepancy between buyers and sellers. And that will then allow us, allow us to, to know that the prices of houses will continue to go up. Are they going to go up at 7 to 10% per year? Probably not. Would we like to see them go up at 4 or 5? Most likely that's what's going to happen. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other factor that we've got, Terry, is uh, new construction. Mm. When you look yeah. around the uh, the suburbs, the outskirts, that's where all your new construction is going. You've got a lot of townhouses being built. The first time home buyer has been shut out of the market uh, for too long. And the builders have recognized that and they're doing their darndest to come up with the inventory to help the first time home buyer and of course the trade up home buyer people are moving and a lot of slab homes yeah and people are moving farther out into the suburbs uh carl and carly moved out to minnetrista they don't have to commute into downtown anymore because they can work from home that's mm -hmm. that's the change in the demographics that we're seeing yeah people are working from home more and they don't have to rely on going into 
the downtown office uh, space. So they can buy farther out into the suburbs and a different mm -hmm. quality of life. So, so with that said, when you're talking with your buyers, there is hope for buyers, absolutely. If someone's gonna do an interim move, you know, you could, should instill some confidence that that interim move may not be for a real long period of time because this market probably in the next two months is going to soften a little bit. We expect interest rates to go up. We expect supply to go up. Is it gonna create a balance? Absolutely not. Would we like a balance? Yes. It was my opinion that in two, 2015, when we had seven buyers for seven houses, it was like real estate bliss. It was like the greatest real estate year ever because it was perfectly balanced. It worked out great. Um, you know, are we gonna get there? Probably not for three or four years. You know, so is that bubble gonna burst? Not according to the information that we're presenting right now. No bubble. Yep. What about all those that the forbearance thing, you don't think that's gonna play any part in this? I do, I, I, I do know that it will. Uh, there are properties that will be foreclosed upon. Uh, those that were affected by the COVID, by unemployment, uh, that just, uh, they went through their relief funds, uh, there will yeah. be a surge of foreclosed properties coming on the market. Uh, it's inevitable. Is it going to be huge like it was back in 08 and 09? No, but there will be foreclosed properties hitting the market after the forbearance period. Yeah, and that's, that's an interesting perspective. Mine's a little bit different. Um, and it's not that I'm an eternal optimist. I'm certainly not. Katie, am I an optimist? <laughs> I mean, Jordan. Oh, by the way, this is Jordan. Jordan, not Katie. Jordan, I'm an optimist. <laughs> no, <laughs> no I'm sorry. Um, but I would say based on, sorry, Jordan, I would say based on the, um, on think, looking back and seeing, so I, I'll say, I'll agree with Jim in the sense that yes, there, there may be foreclosures. Um, I am going to say that my expectation is that there are going to be significantly less than people anticipate as with relation to the forbearance. And this is why the people who went into forbearance and took advantage of it. Well, first of all, not everybody needed it. It was available. It was free money, easy. I mean, people who are doing just fine in these upper 50% industries, they also accepted the forbearance because there was no reason not to, right? So I'd say that. 50% of them didn't need it at all, but it was available, so they took it. Not going to be any risk there. The other 50% who that they needed it, they got into themselves into a situation while unemployment is turning. But more importantly, when did they buy their house? If they bought their house a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, this is still in conservative lending, and values of houses have been going up. So again, in order to go into foreclosure, the value of the house has to be lower than what's owed on the house. That's where I think we okay. are much safer position. Because I just think that people are just. Yeah, you may see an uptick in short sales. Right. All right. What is, yeah. what is the best thing we can do to prepare for short sales and foreclosures? Sell the house before they go into short sale and foreclosure because you can yeah. them. Right. But I'm just saying, like, what kind of classes would you say are, are best to take to really know what we're doing? Well, first of all, I was a foreclosure expert back in 2007 and 8 because you, you had to be if you, you had to be. continue yeah. to do business. So we did, we did about 30 foreclosed properties per year with Mark V and Zweifel, an attorney's firm. And the best advice I can give you is um, avoid them with everything in your entire being. Don't ever sell one ever. So really, that's an absolute sure. nightmare. It's incredibly difficult. It's 10 times yeah. the amount of time you're gonna, uh, your commissions will get cut. The probability of it going through in a short sale and getting approved is low. Um, so yeah. yeah, avoid them like the plague. Let somebody else do it. I agree. Short sales are just an absolute nightmare. Um, I, I had a couple and I just said, never again. Uh, foreclosures are different. They're owned by the banks. The banks don't want that inventory. So they want to sell them and blow them out of their inventory. Short sales are a different animal altogether. And God, they're a nightmare to handle. So how would you describe a short sale? I guess I've never done a short sale. 
We should have a whole nother class on this. What do you think? Yeah, that's another class. I'm gonna give you I'm gonna give you the very, very short explanation. It's very simple. Okay. Once short. <laughs> once uh buy once a seller is unable to make payments let's say, okay terry i'm going to use you okay because you're a little crazy let's just say terry stays crazy and this is what happens she decides not to make payments on her mortgage for four months after four months her bank which is u.s bank says you know what terry we're going to file a lawsuit against you we're going to file foreclosure that's a lawsuit against terry to get the house in lieu of the debt they're like, you know what? You're not paying for the house anymore. So we're going to take the house in lieu of the debt. So they file foreclosure against her. Okay. A sheriff knocks on her door and says, here's your lawsuit against you for the bank, U.S. bank to take your house instead of the debt because you're not paying your debt. You suck. So that's what they say. And then they're like, here you go. So the next thing that happens is that two months later, there's a sheriff sale and I'm simplifying this. There's a sheriff sale at the sheriff sale. The bank gets the right then to take your house in lieu of the debt. However, we live in Minnesota, which is pretty freaking fluffy. And as a result, they give sellers six months to redeem themselves on the debt, even though they, even though they know Terry's a crazy person and isn't going to pay her mortgage ever again. Don't I get to rob a bank in this fun story? In, in, the, in the redemption period, Terry hires Jim and says, Jim, I know you love to sell houses in foreclosure during the redemption period. Please put the house on the market and try to sell it. Here's where it becomes simple. Terry's mortgage was $200,000. Her house is worth 180. Jim can sell at 180 minus expenses, gives the bank 170. They just shorted the bank. That is a short sale. They are shorting the bank the amount of money that is owed against the property. Okay. Now, at the end of the redemption period, because Jim just wasn't good enough to get the deal negotiated with the banks or he found out that Terry didn't only have a first mortgage, but she had a second with TCF and a third with Wells Fargo. Um, Jim can't get it done. At the end of the redemption period, that, that then gets converted and then the title gets transferred to the bank. And now it's what Jim said is a bank owned property. Totally different situation. In a, in a short sale, you have to get approval from the bank for them to, you know, sell or, you know, to, to give up that, you lose $30,000 in a short sale because Terry was crazy, right? And afterwards, it's just the bank saying, hey, we got $200,000 in debt. Somebody sell this house and give us the best, the most you can. And boom, they can respond quickly and get the house sold. But okay. We don't have to story talk. time again. That was fun. We don't, Terry, we don't ever want to talk about foreclosures or short sales again. So don't bring them up because they're terrible. Okay. Them, avoid them entirely. Deal. Stay away from them. When someone Deal. says, hey, let me teach you about foreclosures, say, no, thank you very much. I'm going to go sell regular houses. Good luck. Okay. Okay. Good to know. Selling bank owned properties is not for the faint of heart. Oh. I well, this is so good, though, you guys, because I was really thinking, oh, crap, you know, we're headed for that. I mean, so this is super important and good to know. All right. There, there's something else I wanted to share. Um, because I, I had this experience just uh, not too long ago with a buyer client. Uh, they were qualified for this and they were looking for properties that were, you know, not too far from there. And because they had such limited negotiating room, they were losing out on every offer that they made. Yeah. So if this is their ceiling, I said, all right, instead of looking at properties in this category, lower the price point. So yeah. they lowered the price them that much more wiggle room and negotiating room and guess what happened they were able to come up and we won the bid so now did you pay the, over what they got appraised for uh actually it did uh, turn out that they had to pay two thousand dollars more than the appraised value but that was part of the strategy they were prepared for that they had the cash yeah. set aside for that so don't get locked into any one particular strategy or tactic because sometimes you have to be really, really flexible and, and, and it's kind of like boxing. You, you, you got to be quick on your feet and, and be able to move around and, and, and coach them uh, on, on how to be flexible. You know, you got to try different Don't strategies. like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Yes, Mohammed. So when you bring that uh, price point down, it gives you more bargaining room. That's a strategy. Oh, that's good. 
you know, look, look at a, a different area, geographic area, you know, talk to a different lender. I mean, there are just so many different ways that you can package an offer. Um, and that keeps, you know, it, it, it goes in with our knowledge of the market, our knowledge of financing, work very closely with your lender. Uh, they can help you structure the best, strongest transaction you know, for your, your buyer client. And it works. Mm -hmm. It just works. That's um, super good. One additional side note uh, for Terry, and I can't believe I'm going back here. This is frustrating. But um, one additional side note with relation to the foreclosure potential is that the banks now are poised and in a position and have ah. systems in place to do loan modifications. Yes. So back to Terry's mm. situation, Terry you know, get served foreclosure and she goes to the bank you know, during the redemption period and says, hey guys, I'm going to file a loan modification. Here's what happened in my life. This is why I have a forbearance, or not a forbearance, I have a, Jim, what's the word for something bad happens to you and you got to write that letter? Oh, hardship. Hardship. But a hardship. He's got a hardship, right? Terry has a it hardship. Could job, it could be a, a, a divorce, it could be health issues. Yeah. Yeah. Hardship. Yeah, the hardship. So you explain the hardship to the bank and the bank says, okay, you had a $200,000 mortgage and this is what your payment was. We're going to restructure your loan. And for a period of two years, we're going to drop your payment, right? So first, the banks already have these systems in place so that we don't know right. what happened in 2007 and eight. And second, I don't know if you've noticed, but we have a government that has no issue whatsoever spending money at all, especially on stuff like this. So there will be government funding available for loan modifications, for sure. So that's, See, that was, that's gonna oh, limit, sorry. it'll limit foreclosures to a certain degree. Yeah. That was the thing that was scaring me is that they just kept kicking the can down the road. And I thought, man, it's gonna smack us when it smacks us, you know? So, yeah. but I mean, from what you guys are saying, this is so helpful, so helpful. Yeah, and, and here's one other key element. Uh, we have to display and model correct behavior. By that, I mean, if the client is all in a dither, we have to be cool, calm, and collected. Some people are going to rely more on facts than emotion, but the emotional piece is going to be huge in the buying and selling process. And it's up to us to maintain our demeanor, calm, and keep them calm. And if you can't, this is really is too. Yeah, and if, if if you can't, I mean, obviously, you guys have you've been exposed to my personality a certain degree here, and I'm obviously opinionated and a little bit direct and maybe a little bit too abrupt in general. Um, find yourself a business partner, somebody who's opposite, somebody who's calm, somebody who's more like Jim, you know. And my business partner Sherry, and she's very very calm. And uh, that creates a great sense of balance or uh, put somebody else on your team or get on a team where you find someone who's got balance. So, because I get- funny that you didn't mention my name for that. You and I together, oh man, we would just <laughs> roll people right over. We just bulldoze them. <laughs> <laughs> We'd kill them all. <laughs> uh, yeah, we were fast enough. <laughs> yeah. All right, we're starting to run out of time. Any other uh, questions? Um, are these actual um, graphs that you bring to your listing appointment? What would you recommend? And could we get whatever you recommend? We can make these available to you. Wendy has them. And are they are they ones that you actually use? I use the income one, the the income by uh, industry one. Yeah. In yeah. on you know, in, in, in appointments. And until I had this one here, I literally would draw it on a draw piece of paper. It. Yeah. <laughs> I use this one as well. I use the home price one. And then I use Jim, can you show us that one by industry again? And did you explain these? I, I got on a little bit late. So I'm thinking you explain, explain them at, a little bit more in detail at the beginning. So if I listen to the recording again, are we yeah, actually, the first, Jim, you want to pull that first graph up? The very top one? 
we talked a little bit about this one, you know, the bubble versus it not being a bubble right now. So uh, the three we showed you are the three that I would encourage you to bring to a listing appointment because it just it just shows that you are, especially if you're a newer realtor, you explaining these three graphs are showing your expertise in the industry. Yeah, and these are the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, right down here. So they're they're from Keller Williams International. So I mean these are we're not making up these numbers. So this gives you credibility. So I'll pop out of here in just a second because I, lo I lose the very best director of operations ever. The young lady's name is Jordan Welly. I lose her here in 10 minutes. So I got to wrap up a couple of things. So um, any questions for, for me specifically afterwards, don't hesitate to email and ask questions. Um, Jim, thanks so much for having this stuff available for people. I think it's great. And uh, thank you guys. So, so do we contact? Oh, sorry, Jim. Yeah, go ahead. Um, do we contact Wendy to get these slides sent to us? I could probably send them to you as well because she sent them to me and I should be able to forward them on to you. Oh, I would oh my very gosh. much appreciate that. Yeah, I would love that. I would, yeah, love I, that. I had trouble getting them, you guys. I had trouble with the link, so Lydia actually sent them to me as a PDF. So, email me and I'll email it back to you. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks, much, guys. guys. You're Super welcome. cool. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Make it a great day. Thank you. You All too. Right. Thank you. Bye.